It's a recording with John Coles on the 11th of April 2002 with Nancy Ashworth and Richard Bunning. John, which were um, the first sites that you excavated in this area in the peat? Well, I was working in Cambridge at the time and Harry Godwin was Professor of Archaeology, Professor of, of uh, Environmental Sciences at Cambridge. and He'd been working in the peat for many years, perhaps over 20 years, and he was the one who introduced me to the environmental aspects of the peat and my other professor, Graham Clark, introduced me to the the archaeological implications of what was going on in the Somerset Levels and they both in their own way introduced me and brought me down and showed me around and um, persuaded me successfully to undertake the work. And the first little site was a site that Harry Godwin had worked on at Chapwick Station. So when we first came down, the railway was still functioning along the old south drain, and the railway station at Chapwick Station was still there, a nice wooden building. And Godwin had found some elk droppings and some pieces of worked wood at the Chapwick Station site. And that was my first little excavation with four students, I think it was, four or five students. And I was able to advertise that the communications were such that you could get the train from somewhere or other and actually stop at Chapwick Station and there was the site. It was the easiest access to a site that I've ever had in my life. And we would work away and the little train went by about once a day. Soon after that, of course, it was whisked away by Her Majesty's government, and that was the end of it. And how long was the excavation at that site? How many months, Well, we were just... I think that was probably a two-week exercise, but I think within the first three days we realised that there was going to be very little structural evidence still surviving on that particular little site and so we started to do field work straight off and I think that was when we encountered the Abbot's Way over to the over to the west and began to think about picking that up because that was a site that Harry Godwin had heard about had been found in the 19th century and had dearly wanted to find again so he could do his environmental work but he couldn't find it at the time because peat cu- cutting wasn't going on at the right places and so on, or depths. But when we carried our, out our little work, um, there was the Abbot's Way in section. So that was, I think, my, my first proper excavation, about 12, no, eight, to, 8 to 10 metres of the Abbot's Way, with, again, a, a student party of... Uh, I think it was three people, all of whom went on to become, I'm happy to say, famous archaeologists. Well, it was Pat Carter, who uh, ended up as a keeper of archaeology at Cambridge University Museum. Uh, Vinicom Carter, Pat Vinicom Carter, professor in South Africa. And Garth Sampson, who's professor of archaeology somewhere in Texas. And they're all quite experienced people when they arrived and mm. they were working with John Coles on the in the peat. Well I was working in Cambridge at the time and Harry Godwin was professor of introduced me and brought me down and showed me around and um, first came down the ring along the old South Drain station at Shapwick State Building. And that was my first little ex- for students. I was able to advertise that it was the easiest access to a site that I've ever had in my life. And we would work away. And how long was the excavation at that site? How many months? Weeks? Well, we were a little site to do field work. Straight that was when we and up. Godwin had 19th century to find again but he couldn't find it. Peat cutting wasn't going on places and so on. Or, uh, I think it was three people, all of whom went on to become a manager. 
somewhere. And they're all experienced. Mm. They were very, and the peat cutters were very unaware was around. They'd seen lots of stuff. And that was why they both brought me down and said, Coles, this is a good opportunity. Do you want me to take on the Bronze Age in the peats? And Eric took one look and said, not in 89, so it's a fair old whack. And from then on, uh, we did Peter Alexander, oh, very, very him. Alan Foster, the foreman, he was very sweet. All these people were hand cutting. And a couple of years after that, things like that, and carry very small scale excavations by myself, oh, silly thing to do. A parcel by the Eclipse Peat Works. This would be in 19. Cambridge. We opened it and it was obviously a worked piece of wood. And then, well, various other people, other people. Joan Taylor was there for a while. Uh, I forget most of the names they've written down somewhere or other. And that was the beginning of the great, the great project on this and the Eclipse Peat Helpful. They turned into Fison's later on and gave us lots of facilities. And where we're standing now, which is along the, what we call the railway site, the big expanse of reeds in front of us. And this was our biggest excavation, I think probably in the whole history of the sweet track at the railway site, which was 110 or 100 meters long. And we found out that Fison's were going to be cutting the peat in this great expanse of field in front of us and thought this is laid out our great cross the peat b and b somewhere or other back just as back its way along the grid which had no resemblance to where the street track was <laughs> we were incredibly lucky last year because we were for 50 meters off the grid line by that stage anyway so the machine did all off and we carried out this great excavation and at that time we were being funded by cambridge university the only source of money i think it was we used to pay our diggers five pounds a week. And when we were full, when we had our full complement, anybody else who came, and we would still get diggers for a pound a week. And they'd camp at Rose Farm. And, uh, and anyways, at, that, that, at this time, the Department of the Environment were aware, wrote me a letter and actually offered me money. Would you like some of our money? Which must be a fairly unique. <laughs> and we well, said, I said, yes, pounds. And then in 73, we were able to work with the, not only the Eclipse stroke Fison's, but also the God, and was with the, with the Godwin people, who were extremely handy. And in the middle of, uh, we also got in contact with the, some of the farmers who had structures on their land that we had managed to trace, the Abbot's Way, the Bell Track, and they, they were all very anxious to please and, and give us permission and so on. And as you probably know, the, the bell track ran into the West High Island and beside it was... The, um, the structures after local companies and local people? Yes, it did. It did. It, I think it was just an inspiration. I think they quite enjoyed it. Um, the Eclipse, the Eclipse Hurdle track and so on, please throw Fison's. One or two people complained that they hadn't got, hadn't been named yet. And I said, well, <laughs> you haven't found it. Um, and of course, the, the best one was he was such a, a wonderful man, and, and people do wonder why it's called sweet. Mm. Were people over his worth? No, I don't think they probably were. Uh, the attitude towards things in the peat and things made of wood. Down at Chapwick at the factory site on the sweet track where we carried out big. 10 metres wide and so on and all this fantastic wood would be laid out and we'd have open days which are always terribly successful and then people would come along and look at this wonderful Neolithic or gold you see and you just thought well it's a bit of old wood in eat and it wasn't and we began to date but the normal I think peat cutters were interested but it, and it's also true to say that some of the peat cutters unnamed just couldn't care less they, they just they just thought that we are being paid peace rates and we should just press on. And very experienced peat cutters who always reported things to us. Most of our discoveries were made by peat cutters, not by 
us. And so our, as Richard well, well knows, made most of his discoveries in the pub or something like that, because that's, that was where you know, Waltons and Rowlands and all manner of structures. Do you think that there were any artefacts that haven't been handed in to you? I should think uh, and visit as many of the peat cutters, homes and farmers as possible whenever this but that's just the luck of the draw and you just do the best you can with that. Cool. And, and the important thing was that remit from the Department of the Environment and English Heritage was not really to go around and find of information that had no context mm. association and so on. These are not terribly important. Mm. It was the environmental setting that, mm. that allowed us to not only standard pollen analysis and peat to more or less invent, I mean, it wasn't anything to do with me, but as people we employed invent studies of beetle in that. There's a whole range of techniques that were in the levels and all that had to do because when we, so we asked the county museum um, if they were in or Bronze Age very little of which had ever been found or survived for conservation and they said we would be interested in results but we can't pay for any conservation so we decided to set up our own trolley so called and the first lot was the Abbot's Way timbers which I took back to Cambridge and tank in my study in Cambridge uh, with fish tank heaters and wax bathtub and we conserved some Abbot's Way timbers there not very well, but there was an attempt. We went to Fison's, the eclipsed Peter, to Peter Alexander, and said, can you help us? And he said, yes, you can have such and such a building. And we installed our own system, and we ran off his Fison's electricity. We were supposed to pay for it, but after a year, they said, well, we forgot to read the meter. So, so Fison's actually paid for the conservation for about eight years of tanks running non-stop. I mean, it was I mean, a huge electricity bill. And we conserved and experimented with different methods and so on for years and years and years. It was always, it was always a, a, a very difficult procedure, a conservation lab in the levels, miles from Cambridge and miles from Exeter, and a field archaeologist having to work in the field and mm. monitor this and so on. And uh, I would never do it now, but um, it seemed to work. And the result is that I think I, that Somerset Levels prehistoric woodworking collection is the biggest probably in Western Europe. There's nowhere else they have have they been able to preserve so much, such a, a good sample of mm. prehistoric woodworking. So I think at the end it was it was well worth it. And we did have. I remember when we set it up, I had a lot of um, irate letters from professional conservators saying how fine you want to set up your lab you must employ a professional conservator and I said you know, send us the money and they said we haven't got any money but you, you, how, how dare you try and conserve things without a professional conservator and so I said well tough so we just went ahead and did it and then English Heritage as Richard knows had this little wood studies this booklet business mm -hmm. this report and I remember attending the meeting of all the professional conservators concerned with wood, Jim Spriggs and all the others, English heritage. And they'd had a little survey done, and they said, now, where, where are the good collections of wood, you see? And somebody said, well, the only real collection is from the... And I sort of smiled. They said, Somerset Levels. And I said, yes. And the conservators said, hmm, yes. <laughs> and one or two said, well, well done. Because <laughs> if, you know, what else could one do? I think it's true to say that the Somerset Levels project was was very much a, a do-it-yourself. We had to we had to invent the techniques to, to dig, and there were some, sometimes they were good, and sometimes they were maybe not so good. And the ways of studying things, and the publications, and so yeah. on. And the ways of excavating things as well were, were quite novel, weren't they? Yes, yes. The little plastic spatulae that we used, a little wooden, mostly plastic spatulae, which we had made specially, invented by ourselves and were ideal for, for working in the peat. And the, they were little pieces of plastic, transparent plastic. We painted little red n numbers on them, and every digger was given one when he arrived and was accepted, he or she. And they don't, before they got their five pounds a week, they had to present their spatulae, because if, because if they'd lost it, then they were in serious trouble. <laughs> so they only cost about five P to make, but on the other hand, if you're in the middle of the Somerset Levels, and, you, mm. and you're looking for a plastic spatula, 
So there's no replacements around. How did you get on with convincing local peat diggers or landowners to keep their land wet? That's quite difficult because we were in the business um, being paid for by English Heritage and DOE to, to carry out rescue archaeology. Uh, we were not supposed to be terribly political. The companies, the bigger companies, the Godwins and the Clips Stroke Fisons, were made well aware and were well aware that the structures were A, important, and B, would decay if too much drainage went on around them. But we definitely did not apply a lot of pressure to, on them to, to keep their peat flooded. Um, we didn't think this was our remit, and I think it was only just a matter by a, a process of information supplied that they be of a Godwin's and excavation and whatever analyses you can introduce and so on. So I think that that, that has worked. Um, farther north, the sweet track is runs through the far, um, is probably was in as good a condition yeah. in the nature reserve, but it's wet or damp, but it's actually, mm. and it's probably for the future. Well, I can't think of anything else that, it, that really rings a bell at this wow. stage other than... Well, there's your no feet on peat rule, of course, going back to the excavation and the um, oh, yes. excavating from planks. I still feel it all back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, we used that peat was soft, but that um, prehistoric wood was even softer. <laughs> and after all, that's what we were. So the rule was um, planks alongside, of course, the excavation and uh, tow boards. We invented and made, we had wonderful tow boards made in Cambridge. Still used today, and 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 I suppose one thing worth recording somewhere is is the huge amount of, of uh, help that I got from the University Museum in Cambridge, not from the faculty or anything like that, just by going straight into the workshop with Pat Smith, who was the head of workshop, and he he installed the conservation labs and in, devised the shape of the tanks and uh, organized their production and uh, took advice and got the fiberglass heating panels and made the tow boards for us and varnished them up with best marine ply and, and oh, he, he was absolutely fantastic but yes the rule was no feet on peat so um, you had to work on planks and tow boards until one day on the I think this was on the Baker platform the rule was stressed no peat on peat and so on and one undergraduate, or possibly two, one undergraduate from the University of Oxford, which was very satisfying, <laughs> um, was found to be standing on the Baker Wood. And we said, what, what the hell are you doing there? And he said, I'm just not standing on Pete, sir. <laughs> and so we, we, we imposed the penalty of shifting the soil heap, which took him two days. <laughs> very satisfactory. Ha, 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 ha.